does this happen in real life? Through the choices we make. The choices we make are the choices that the Holy Spirit helps us to make. We choose to do the right thing in situations and then we trust God's Spirit to give us the power, the love and the faith and wisdom to do it. Since God's power lives inside of us, these things are always available for the asking. And so, whenever we're doing anything, we have to keep referring to God. We have to keep asking Him to guide us. And that's what this, this particular area is telling us. He said, through the choices we make, we will know if the Holy Spirit is guiding us right or wrong. I mean, not guiding us wrong, but are we listening to the Holy Spirit? Because remember the voices in our head? You may have chosen to take the louder one. The quiet one is the one from the Holy Spirit. And, and those choices are what makes us who we are. They're the choices that makes us who we are. So there's so many choices we make. Like I chose to read this book to you. It's a choice that I made. And it was a, a, a simple whisper in my ear. Take this book, read it and share it with people. Because the issues you are dealing with, there may be so many people out there struggling with such issues. Recently, I, I, um, I just turned 24 years in marriage. And I did not make a big noise about it. Now, I naturally get excited when bigger things happen in my life. You know, like my children's birthday, my birthday, my friend's birthday, my husband's birthday. I, I would do things about it. But the choice of marriage is one of the big choices you will make if you haven't made it. Or if you've made it, it's one of those areas. Remember we talked about life is a test. It's one of those areas you have to be strong enough to deal with. And it's one of the, the most challenging areas I have had to deal with is one of the reasons I chose to read this book as well to understand what I'm going through in life. So that was a choice I made. And now the choice I made is one of the things giving me problems or making me think or making me worry. So how do you deal with difficult choices? I know so many people are going through difficult marriages as well. How do you cope with it? These are some of the things we're looking at here. So since God's power lives in the inside of us, these things are always available for us to ask, to ask God for support. And that's one of the things I did, asking him for support. And this book came to hand. And I'm so glad I did, because so many things has revealed itself to me since I started reading it. Understanding the fact that unity is the focus of marriage, not uniformity. These are some of the things that you are going to find out there when you have issues. How do you cope with them? So he says we must cooperate with the Holy Spirit's work. Throughout the Bible we see an important illustration over and over. The Holy Spirit releases his power the moment we take a step of faith. And this is called the leap of faith. He said, when jo Joshua, Joshua was forced with an impassin, impassable ba banner, the flood waters of the Jordan River receding, receded only after the leader stepped into the rushing current in obedience and faith. So when we take a leap of faith, God works with us. I absolutely love this one. I think of all the biggest things I've picked up from this book, this is going to be one of my favorite. He says, the Holy Spirit releases his power the moment we take a, a step of faith, which is also known as a leap of faith. <clears throat> and this is how it works. Obedience unlocks God's power. For me, opening this book and starting to read it was a leap of faith. I just believed when God said to me, 
did read this book to clear your head oh and why did i come to this book i've shown you in some of the videos some of the amazing books i read i have been one of those people who is so concerned about what is the reason why am i here and there's a book on man's search for meaning i think that book just has has the title that covers it i don't stop searching for meaning and when i found i was having issues in marriage i realized that i need to find a solution to this problem and this book came to hand now in spite of all the other books that i read to me this book has answered so many questions that i had unanswered and that's why i thought it is important i share it obedience unlocks god's powers god waits for us to act first don't wait to feel powerful or confident in whenever whatever situation you find yourself in and you're struggling to deal with it just trust in god and take action picking this book was an action for me taking on a training when i lost my job years ago to go and start braiding was a, a, a leap of faith because i didn't know which direction it was going to go i used the last money i had in the bank account i used it to spend and take on the braiding course i did and today i get lots of people still calling me and asking questions this is something we put together for anybody who has ever considered i want to work with hair this is a complete package that could get you straight into hair and turn everything around for you with with braids and with extensions and hair and then you see here people not sure what they want to do here this book is reminding us you have to take that leap of faith because if you don't take it if you're still hanging there and waiting god will not act for you until you make the first step do you see why this is so important so whatever ideas that are floating through your head and i know for me i have loads but i got to that point where i was stuck i had no clue what to do next and that's why this book for me has really cleared my way of thinking right now taking that leap of faith you have to make that first move move ahead in your weakness doing the right thing in spite of your fears and your feelings so whenever people are thinking, but I want to do something, but I don't know. I'm still thinking. I'm still wondering. I am worried. Once you make all those comments, you're not entertaining God at all. He's not listening. Because he wants you to make that first step. Don't keep postponing when you would take on training in whatever. If you were thinking, Braden, I have the answer. If you were thinking, Whips, we have the answer. If you are thinking hair extensions, we are here for you. If you are thinking maybe cake making, maybe fashion designing, maybe uh, dancing, maybe uh, um, hall decoration, whatever it is you want to do with your two hands, now is the time to take that action. Stop postponing. This is how we cooperate with the Holy Spirit and it is how we develop our character. Once we take on that leap of faith. The Bible compares spiritual growth to a seed. A building, a child growing up. That's how the Bible compares us. Each metaphor requires active participation. A seed must be planted and cultivated. That's what the Bible says. So that's the same thing with us. When we are thinking of starting anything, we must start. A seed is planted. And I remember when people come here to train and I tell you straight on, which I, I am happy to, to say I do. It is not going to be easy. You have to start from somewhere. When people have this imagination, you remember what he said earlier, that our life here is meant to be comfortable and God should bring us heaven on earth. We are lying to us. It says we're delusional. That's why this book really touches my heart because it's telling me things that I maybe have imagined, but I didn't know it was true. So 
A seed must be planted and cultivated. Do you get the meaning of that? It means whatever it is you want to do, you have to start from somewhere. Plant it and cultivate it, which is with taking care of the grass and removing everything and making sure you water the plant and then it starts to grow. Same thing with anything you want to take on in life. You must start from day one and be ready to work with it. It must be started from the very first block. The first block has to be put down. Remember, he's comparing us with so many things. We're comparing us with a seed, he's comparing us with a building, and he's comparing us with a child growing up. He says a building must be started with the first block. And so imagine these skyscrapers that you see. They didn't just happen to be there. They didn't build it somewhere and then dropped it there. Children must be fed and taken on, and taking on activities and exercises for them to grow. So when you see a new baby just born, the baby doesn't overnight just become an adult. The baby grows and takes the first step and takes the first crawl and takes the first run and says the first word. That's the same thing with everything we do in life. This, are, this applies to business as well. You must start it from day one. What I thought has nothing to do with our salvation. It has everything to do with our spiritual growth. At least eight times in the New Testament, we are told to make every effort in our growth towards becoming like Jesus Christ. Eight times we're told, make every effort. We don't just sit around and wait for it to happen. This is life too. We don't just sit around and expect life to be perfect. Or take life on our own terms. Well, we do nothing. We take no action and something just happens for us. That's not how life is. Reading this book is a good example for me and my state of mind. I know things were going away from me and I chose to invest my time in reading this book. That's how we make difference in life. We invest our time into whatever. If it's a, a business idea, if it's a skill idea, if it is whatever it is, we have to invest something. We have to do the same for our health. If you find your health, you're struggling with it. Spend time, research on whatever that topic is. If you find you're struggling in your marriage, take your time, understand what is going on. If you find you're struggling with happiness, take time to understand what is going on. Research it. Search for the answers and you'll find it. And there's a saying, there's a passage in the Bible, whatever you seek, you'll find. Search and you'll find. Knock and it will be answered. Ask and it is given unto you. And so when I asked, this book came to hand. I, I had bought it some time ago, but somehow my, the voice in my head was like, look for that book. The answer of what you're looking for is there. Paul explains in Ephesians 4, uh, verses two to 20, uh, 22 to 24. Our three responsibilities in becoming like Christ. First, we must choose to let go of our old ways of acting. Everything connected with our old way of life has to go. It is rotting through and through. Get rid of it. That's what Paul says. And I'm calling it a new awakening, or I mean, Ekakolekos is a new earth. We call it a new life because you're starting all over again. The second, we, we must change the way we think. Let the Spirit change your way of thinking. Bible says we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. So our mind is going to change. That's why we call it a new life. The Greek word for transformed meta, meta for Metaphor is used today to describe the amazing change in caterpillar that a caterpillar goes through. <clears throat> you know a caterpillar goes from that stage of being a caterpillar and then it becomes a butterfly. And this is a beautiful picture of what happens to us spiritually when we allow God to direct our thoughts. He says we are changed from the inside. So that's where we're going to. We want to be changed from the inside. 
we become more beautiful and we are set free to soar to new heights. So just like the caterpillar transforming from inside to becoming a butterfly, that's how our thoughts is going to change and we become happier, purer people. Third, we must put on the character of Christ by developing new godly habits. Our habits are going to change now. Our character is essentially the sum of our habits. So the character that we possess is the sum of our individual habits. So we're going to be focusing on changing the individual habits. It is how we habitually act. The Bible says, put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So God uses his words, his people, and circumstances to mold us. All the three that we talked about are indispensable for our character to be developed. We're trying to develop our character now. God's words provide the truth that we need to grow. So when God speaks to us, he's given us the truth. God's people provide the support we need to grow. People around us give us the support we need. Circumstances provide the environment we need to practice Christ-likeness. So if we study our Bible and books like this one that we're reading and we apply God's words and we connect regularly with like-minded people, people who are believers, we learn to trust God in difficult circumstances. He it says it's guaranteed we will become more like Jesus Christ. We all know that Jesus did not have an easy life, yet he was God's only son. So why do we humans expect that we are going to flow through life without any issues? The big message is we should learn to trust God like Jesus did. And then we will overcome like the rest of the people. Many people assume all that is needed for spiritual growth is Bible study and prayer. Um, okay, so we carry on. Many people assume all that is needed for spiritual growth is Bible study and prayer. And I tell you, I was like that too. I read the Bible, I prayed, I listened to various personal development and motivational books, like I said earlier. DVDs, videos, you name them, YouTube. But none of them will fully answer the questions you ask when things get really, really difficult. None of them will. It was all about my understanding, like the butterfly. I was not renewed from the inside. And so that's the whole idea of this new life plan that we're looking at. So some issues in life will never be changed by Bible study or prayer alone. And that's one of the questions most people ask. But if God was real, how come I prayed so much and he's not answering? Because most of the prayers we have are extremely selfish. All we want is just for our own betterment. And you remember the first, uh, the earlier parts of the passage, God is not our servant. He's not there to just every wimp and caprice we need, anything we need, here, here you go. As a parent, you don't do that with your children. So why would God be doing that with us? He knows what he, we're here for his pleasure and he knows the direction he wants to take us through. So it's not everything we wish as humans that is going to happen for us. He says, God uses people to work for us. He usually prefers to work through people rather than perform miracles. Remember, we we're just talking about miracle and how we said, the many people here, the Holy Spirit, would think miracles are about to happen. Say, so, no, he walks through people. And I can really testify to that. I have seen God walking through people. You know, you wanted something so badly, maybe it's something that God knows is a necessity for you. And somehow somebody just walks in and says, oh, do you need this? I just have this and I don't know what to do it. That's just God walking through that person. So that we will depend on each other. That's the reason God uses people. He uses people so we can depend on each other for fellowship. This is again for friendship. Because remember, we are, we are created from God's family. God doesn't want people living in isolation. And he's going to come and explain that. When he explained it, he really stood out for me as well. He wants us to grow to get together. In many religions, the people considered to be the most spiritual, 
by nature and holy and are holy are those who isolate themselves from others and stay in mountain tops and monasteries uninfected by contact with other people so that's where he explains it he says in most other religions people who are holy are always isolated they don't need to be infected by other people but this is where they go wrong because God wants us to interact with each other you cannot sit in isolation and tell yourself you're holy because by being holy you must be tested you must be with other people you must experience things that are not perfect you must deal with circumstances that you don't enjoy circumstances that you don't want to deal with and how do you overcome that that's where the test is and that's where God wants to build your character so this is a gross misunderstanding when we imagine that people should be in isolation and then they are holy so spiritual maturity is not a solitary individual pursuit it's not something you sit on your own and you don't talk to anybody and say I am so spiritual you cannot grow to be Christ like uh, Christ likeness to Christ Christ likeness in isolation you cannot do that you cannot be like Christ and be in isolation because remember when Christ was here what was he like was he always alone you must be around other people and interact with them we need to be part of a community or part of a church this is where your friends come in this is where your family comes in this is where your relatives come in so if you're not interacting with people and you're thinking you're being holy you're getting it all wrong. You say, why? Because true spiritual maturity is about learning to look like Jesus. And we can't practice being like Jesus without being in a relationship with other people. We must relate to other people. That's why I say God is relational. We will have friends. We have families. We have husbands. We have wives. We have children. And so when we interact with people, you remember, unity, not uniformity. People who are different from us. That's when God is beginning to work in us. And that's what God wants from us. Remember, it's all about love. God wants us to love each other. One of the chapters, that's one of the biggest things that came out. We must love each other. Remember the Trinity. God is love. Loving God and loving other people. That's one of the biggest commandments God gave us. The minute you are out of that frame, not remembering to love other people, not remembering to love God, you lost it. Becoming like Christ is a long, slow process of growth. Spiritual maturity is neither instant nor automatic. It is a gradual process, develop, uh, gradual process, progressive development that will take the rest of your life. So, referring to this process, Paul said, This will continue until we are mature as Christ is, and we will be completely like him. We are work in progress. Our spiritual transformation in developing the character of Jesus, we take the rest of our life and carry on till eternity. Bible says, when we are finally able to see Jesus perfectly, we will become perfectly like him. That's a big message. Much confusion in the Christian life comes from ignoring this simple truth that God is far more interested in building our character than he is in anything else. We worry when God seems silent on anything specific. What career should I choose? So you hear people, when, when I say to people, God has made you for something, there's a, there's a path God has created you for, and people go back, I don't know what that part is. Why can't God tell me what that part is? It starts with your natural love for something. Once you have love for something, that's already God telling you, this is it. Like I had natural love for hair. I have natural love for fashion. I just love, I love to share what I know. And these are things that have just proved themselves in me. Because the minute you take on what you don't love, you're going to get frustrated. You will get frustrated. That's how easy it is. And for how long would you live in frustration? 
And that's why we end up with books like this. Because the many things are beginning to really, really upset us and destroy our way of thinking and affecting our thoughts. We are completely derailing from where we should be going. The truth is, there are many different careers that could be in God's will for you. You can always change them from time to time. What God cares about most is that whatever we do, we do it in a Christ-like manner. Whatever we choose to do, we do it having God at the back of our mind. God is far more interested in what we are than what we do. That's another big one. God is interested in what we are, not what we do. And this is a really big one for me too because years ago when I started, let me go into working with braids and working with hair and and I had so many people querying me like, why would you do that? What is so great about braids? You, you, you've gone to university, you've, you've studied this and you studied that, you worked in this place, why are you condescending? To them, they thought I was condescending because I chose to work with a creative art. I saw the beauty of it. And so that's what it is. With attitude and in their head, they will not talk to people who are doing certain skills or certain jobs, they feel better. That's not God. That's arrogance. That's pride. And that's the job of, of the devil. That's his attitude. God is much more concerned about our character than our career. Or our money. Or our bank account. Or our beauty. Or our image. Or the designer clothes that we wear. Or the trips that we've taken in our lifetime. God is not interested in any of that. Because God created all of that. God wants to know the person that you are. We will take our character to eternity and not all these physical things that I've mentioned. They're not going anywhere with us. They will be left here. Bible says don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without thinking. That should answer some people. The Bible said it. Don't be so hooked up on your culture that you fit into it without even thinking, without even asking questions. This is exactly what I'm talking about when people think, because I'm black, I should not wear hair that's different color. There was a time I put some colored hair on my little daughter, you know, in braids, and someone asked me, is this okay for a child? What's the color, go is, in what way is a color hurting a child? And the question I asked was, what would you say to people who are putting chemical relaxers on a two-year-old child? That is affecting the child. So people like that are not thinking. Because somehow in their way of thinking, culturally, it's okay for a black child to have relaxer on her head. Two year old. But a black child cannot have, say, a blonde braids. Oh, that's too much for a child. And I've had someone asking me, oh, are you, what message are you sending across wearing blonde wig? And I said, but I see teenagers walking around naked on Instagram. I see them. They practically wear nothing. And now, did I teach them that? So, we need to find a way to deal with the issues that are in our community. Not to pick on individuals. Not to take attention from what matters. You'll be changed. Bible says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from inside out. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to be to its level of immaturity. Unlike your culture that's dragging you down to the level of immaturity. You don't want to grow. You want to remain in the past. That's something you have to think about. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. We must make a counterculture decision to focus on becoming more like Jesus. Otherwise, other forces like peers, like our co-workers, like our culture, like the parents, all of them will try to mold you into their image. And that's where we are. People think, oh yeah, let, let me sit across a faceless screen and I start telling her how she should dress up. I'm not telling you how you dress up. 
So you have no right standing out there telling me how I should dress up. So don't bring culture into your way of thinking because that's your personal way of thinking. Whenever you look at someone and you have issues with what they wear, is your personal way of thinking. It has absolutely nothing to do with culture. Sadly, a review of even Christian books revealed that many believers have abandoned living for God's great purpose and have settled for personal fulfillment and emotional stability. So again, he's absolutely right on that because I read loads of books, loads. And instead of trying to look at how they can help us to renew our thoughts and renew the way we see life and become this beautiful caterpillar changing into a butterfly, they're telling us about emotional stability and personal fulfillment. And I tell you, this is so real in Nigeria, where I come from. You look at the numbers of churches and you look at what the pastors are doing, you start to wonder, are they really living for God? Is God fulfilling his purpose in people like that? Where all they want to do is take from the extreme poor people and then they become extremely rich. It just doesn't go with the conscience. Oh, he says that is narcissism, not discipleship. Jesus did not die on the cross just so we could live comfortable, well-adjusted, trouble-free lives. He suffered in life and experienced the most painful death bearing the cross for us. His purpose for us is far deeper. He wants us he wants to make us like himself before he takes us to eternity. And that's why our character is being developed. So this is our greatest privilege, our immediate responsibility, and our ultimate destiny. So that's the end of that chapter. But before we finish, we'll go with our usual question. Thinking about that purpose is the title of this chapter. The question is, in what area of your life do you need to ask for the Spirit's power to be like Jesus today? In what area? And the meditation says, as the Spirit of the Lord walks within us, we become more and more like Him and reflect His glory even more. And that's 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. So again, thank you so much for being with us for this whole long chapter. It was really long. Um, we absolutely again appreciate you being there with us and being part of this journey with us. We hope that this book is actually, you know, touching something in your life and helping to renew you like the caterpillar turning into the butterfly. Um, I look forward to seeing you in the next chapter and may God bless you eternally. <music>